your Bible, and I hope you do, please turn in it to Colossians chapter 4. Colossians chapter 4. It's my privilege this week to conclude the book of Colossians, our verse-by-verse study. If you're not familiar here at Calvary Chapel, we study the Bible chapter by chapter, verse by verse, in an effort uh, to declare to you the whole counsel of God. We want to go through everything the Bible has to say, not just pick and choose passages that seem good to us. And so like when we finish Colossians today, like next Sunday, we're going to start 1 Thessalonians because that's literally what's next, right? So we're going through the Bible. But Colossians chapter 4, we're going to be starting in verse 2 in just a moment. But before we do, let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that your word is sufficient for everything we need in life. Lord, we believe that when we open your word, it speaks to us in a way that no other written text will ever be able to speak to us because it is your very word. It's transformative. It changes us. It it transforms us. It makes us more like you, Jesus. And so this morning, we just pray that as we read your word and we discuss it and we meditate upon it, Lord, that you would speak to us in a powerful way about our relationship with you, that you would instruct and teach us into how we can be better followers of you. So, Lord, give us ears to hear what your word says today. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, we're going to start just with the first sentence of this part of the chapter. It's kind of weird. Sometimes the chapter breaks are somewhat strange. So yes, we last week did chapter 4 verse 1, kind of connected back to what was in chapter 3 for Pastor Larry, but now we're starting kind of a new thought. And so verse 2, just that first sentence, it says this, continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. There's an interesting thing that happens. Every time the word prayer is mentioned from a pulpit like this or in the media or around a dinner table with a group of friends, some of whom might be Christians and some of whom might not, where everybody has kind of a different idea of what prayer looks like. I mean, honestly, if we're being realistic, everybody has a different prayer life and it looks different for every single person that's a follower of Jesus. So I want to start out this morning talking about kind of what prayer is not so that we can then lead into what prayer really should look like. So some people have a very twisted idea of how prayer works in the life of a believer. You know, in ancient cultures and even in some places around the world today, prayer is a very ritualized, formalized thing. So uh, if you're coming with us to Israel a couple, a couple weeks or, and all that stuff, or if you're anywhere in the world where there's a high concentration of Muslim people, you will see the calls to prayer happen. And, and this, this large uh, bell or, or trumpet type thing will go off, and all of the people who are uh, you know, Muslims will go, and they will find their mat, and they will point it towards Mecca, and they will begin to bow and say their recited prayers over and over again, and and they do this every day, multiple times a day, as their way to pray. In some places, maybe you grew up in a tradition of of Christianity that taught you formulated prayers. Here's what you need to do. If you want to have a relationship with God, you need to say 10 of this prayer and one of this prayer and do that over and over and over again until you feel better. Some people, their prayer life is kind of um, cliché, Like, rub-a-dub-dub, God bless the grub, let's go. There's kind of a different, that was really stupid. There's kind of a different, um, there's kind of a different attitude that each person and and cultural uh, group inside of Christendom kind of has. And even outside of Christianity, there's these different ideas about what prayer looks like. And and, and I just want to start out with a couple of things that prayer is is not. First of all, prayer is not really to be a, a formulated thing. Now, there's some prayers that I have read that have really impacted my heart. Like, you can go back and you can read, you can get a book of the Puritans' prayers. They would write down their prayers. And, I mean, there's some powerful, 
powerful stuff in there. Hey, a lot of the book of Psalms is people's, you know, mostly David's prayers being written, you know, for us to read, get an insight, get a glimpse into the private life of David and his relationship with the Lord. So reading prayers is not always bad, but prayer is not really meant to be a formulated thing. It's not really meant to be something we read off of a card over and over and over again in order to somehow find favor with God. You know, I was thinking about it today, actually a couple of days ago. Here's the funny thing. If we're in a relationship with someone, okay, uh, could you just imagine if a husband and wife, uh, all of their communication was Hallmark cards? Could you imagine that? Like they wake up in the morning and the wife says, hello, husband. And the husband just pulls through his file and hands her a Hallmark card. And she opens it and says, I love you so much today. She's like, oh, that's so sweet. Hey, could you take out the garbage? Yeah. Here's a Hallmark card. And it's like after a while, like would that relationship thrive? Let me just ask you that. No, right? Like that would be such a weird thing to just constantly be handing Hallmark cards to someone that you're supposed to have an intimate relationship with. You're supposed to have this love language. Now, I'm not saying don't get her cards, right? Like sometimes that's a great thing. Like don't forget the card. That's a big deal. But don't only use cards. Don't only use someone else's words. Don't only use a formalized statement about how I love you. I think sometimes in our prayer life, if we're not careful and if we've been brought up in that kind of tradition or whatever it might be, we can start passing up Hallmark cards to God without even realizing that's what we're doing. And that environment, that attitude of prayer does not cultivate relationship. It cultivates transaction. See, transactional relationship is where I walk in, I give you something, you give me something. Like the guy that works at the Chinese food place down the street from my house. Now, I know this guy because I see him obviously often. But we don't have a relationship. Like I walk in, I give him probably way more money than it really should cost. And he gives me my food. And I might say, hey, man. And he might say, what's up? But ultimately, we don't have relationship. We just have transaction. God doesn't want to be in a transactional relationship with you where you throw up a Hallmark card and he throws down a blessing. That's not how it works. So that's not what prayer is. And in fact, when Jesus began to teach his disciples about prayer, he started out with a warning before he taught them. So in Matthew chapter 6, he's going to get to the Lord's Prayer, which we know, which is not supposed to be something that's repeated over and over again. It's supposed to be an outline uh, of topics to share with the Lord. But before he ever gets to the, our Father who art in heaven, all that stuff, he says this, verse 7 of Matthew chapter 6. And when you pray, do not heap up, heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Jesus right off the bat says, don't do that. When it comes to prayer, it's not about quantity, it's about quality. And I think we can see that that's true in any relationship, isn't it? Think about your relationship you have with a loved one or a spouse or a family member. It's not about how much time you spend with that person. It's about quality time that you spend with that person. So prayer is not that. And it's not um, something that just you say and, and you don't have to get, like all of a sudden it's crazy. Sometimes you're praying with people and they go from being like a normal person to speaking King James English. You guys know what I'm talking about? It's like, thou, O Lord, art thy something. You're like, dude, just talk. Like, what are you doing? Like, as if somehow to come before the Lord, we have to put on this air of superiority or whatever it is. I don't know why we do it. But all of a sudden, we transform. So we don't always talk to the Lord the way we talk to one another. So prayer is not to meant to be this weird King James English Hallmark card repetitive thing. Prayer is meant to be a conversation. And that's ultimately what prayer is. When we look back through scripture time and time and time again, you don't find these ancient heroes of the faith who God empowered and walked with during their life to serve him. You don't find them offering up the same prayers over and over again. There might be similar themes, but they're having a conversation with the Lord. 
And it's not this weird, awkward thing. And sometimes I think that we misunderstand what it means to go before the Lord. Because sometimes we treat prayer or going before the Lord kind of like a visit to the principal's office. You know, you dress real nice, like you, you kind of come in, you're like, yes, sir, no, sir, of course, you know, I'll do whatever you want. As if it's got to be this weird formalized thing. You know where that comes from? That attitude comes from a lack of confidence in relationship. When you first start out dating someone, you dress up real nice, right? You go out, you want to kind of give off this uh, impression, right? But I've been married seven years now, and I don't care what my wife thinks of me, to be honest. A lot, I mean, I love her and I'll try, but there's times where I'm like, I don't care if I'm wearing a shirt with holes in it, right? I don't care if you know, I'm wearing my pajama pants. Like I'm not getting up in the morning and like running in the bathroom while she's sleeping and trying to like brush my teeth and do my hair and then go lay back down. <laughs> You're not doing that. When you have comfort in relationship, some of y'all thought I was being mean there. Did you catch that? When I'm having comfort in relationship, I'm not obsessed with the impression or the image that I'm giving off. So why is it then that we have this feeling of like trepidation and fear when it comes to communicating with the Lord? Well, it, it stems from lack of comfortable relationship. And I say all of that to say this. The beginning of this verse is telling us to continue steadfastly in prayer, which means there's a problem. We don't have to be told to continue steadfastly in prayer unless there's a struggle to continue steadfastly in prayer. Like God doesn't command us to do things that we do naturally. So we're being encouraged and told, this is an imperative, we're being told to continue steadfastly in prayer. And if you have a hard time with that, let me just tell you, you're not the only one. Think about the disciples when Jesus took them to the Garden of Gethsemane and he's trying to pray and they, what are they doing? They're falling asleep. I don't know if there's a single story in the Bible that I empathize more with than that. You guys feel me? Like, oh, I'm trying to pray and then all of a sudden I'm asleep. It happens to me all the time. So you're in good company if you struggle to be consistent in your prayer life. But there's an encouragement right here from the Lord through the Apostle Paul saying, continue steadfastly in prayer. So what does it mean to continue steadfastly? Well, it means continue to do it. Do it with persistence in fervor. Continue to apply pressure. Continue to move forward in your prayer life. A couple of years ago, uh, I took a trip up to Virginia. We were speaking at a camp, uh, and I had a group with me. So Rick Cleveland and Sheila, uh, Karen, who plays keyboard with us, and, um, and Hannah Sarver, Pastor Larry's daughter, we're all driving, and we had to get up at four in the morning to drive through this rural area of Virginia, like the crisscross roads and the whole deal. And so we got up early, it's four in the morning, we're driving, and all of a sudden, we run into this fallen tree across the road. And so we park, and it's, it's 4 in the morning. There's no one within 20 miles of us, I, I think, probably. You know, like, there's just, like, we're in the middle of nowhere. And we have to keep going, or we're going to be late to where we need to be. And so we get out of the car, me and Rick. Uh, the girls just stayed in the car, which I thought was kind of not very helpful. But, I mean, being honest, like, what's Karen going to do? She's not going to pick up anything. So, like, we're, we're trying to get out of the car. So we get out, and we're looking at this tree, and we're like, what are we going to do? So Rick and I are looking at it. So we, we try to push the tree forward, and we couldn't. And, I mean, I'm, I'm a fairly strong big guy, and I just couldn't push the tree. I couldn't move it. And so we're sitting there, like, having this discussion. Like, what are we going to do? And Rick's like, I got a skill saw. Like those little tiny saws. We're gonna, well, maybe we can just like cut, like start cutting. And I'm like, that's going to take, you know, never. We're never going to do that. Like, so we're sitting there and, and we go back to the car and the women are sleeping. And we're like, what are we going to do? So we're sitting there thinking. And finally I said, you know what we should do? What if we push the tree the other way, like towards us? So we get in the car and I back the car up and we get out. And with all my might and strength and Rick too, we just kept pushing and kept pushing. Little by little by little by little, little by little. And we finally got the tree to move just enough where we could move the car around. And so we're driving. Like two hours later, the girls wake up and they're like, that was weird. Why were we stopped for a minute? But, you know, it's like we had, we had to get out and we had to push. And it wasn't easy. 
And, and I say all that to say this, like sometimes when it comes to prayer, we see the obstacle and we, we try like once and then we're like, oh, that's not moving. And we don't get out and start putting constant applied pressure, thinking through it in different ways. And, and I think we have this temptation sometimes to pray one time for something. And if things don't change, we go, well, I tried. There's a quitter in all of us. In, all, in our culture today, we struggle with tr trying to do hard things. But prayer is not meant to be a throw one up and things will change immediately. Prayer is not a sprint. It's a marathon. When we go before the Lord in prayer, we should be praying steadfastly, continuously, so that things will begin to change. And that's the crazy thing about prayer. God makes it very clear in his word that he listens to and answers prayer. And I got to be honest with you, I can't figure that one out. I can't understand why the God of the universe cares about our opinion, and when we're praying, he listens and responds. I think about just a couple weeks ago, we were teaching from the book of 2 Samuel on Wednesday nights, and God had pronounced a judgment plague that would happen against the nation of Israel in response to their sinful behavior, and he began to execute the plague against people, and thousands of men and women were dying in Israel, and David stood up and prayed, oh God, please stop, and it says, God heard David's prayer and he relented. Why? Why did he do that? Why did God do that? I can't understand it, but I can declare it to you. God hears our prayers. Prayer changes things. And so there's this old cliche, and I, I know it's cliche, but I love it. Um, and when it comes to prayer, you got to push. You know what push means? Pray until something happens. Pray until something happens. Keep on praying. Don't give up. I read a story a long time ago in a book called Why Revival Tarries by Leonard Ravenhill. And it was about this old Welsh man. You guys know in Wales and outside of England. And for his entire life, this man prayed that God would send revival to his nation. He prayed and prayed and prayed and he watched his nation walk through ridiculous politics, ridiculous war situations, just morality that had gone rampant. He just prayed and prayed and prayed. He lived to be in his 90s, and he never saw it happen. But what's interesting is that the day that that Welshman went home to be with the Lord is the day that the Welsh revival began in Wales. He never got to see the result of his prayer. But his prayer was mighty effective. And if you know anything about the Welsh revival, it was a revolutionary, just total, it was like the Jesus movement that happened in America happened there and, and people's lives were changed forever. You think about that and you go, that came from prayer, a persistence to pray until something happens. Our culture has a mentality of giving up easily. And we gotta make sure that that doesn't become a part of what we do. But in addition to praying continuously, there's a second thing here. So look what it says. Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. What we're being told here is that prayer requests coming before the Lord should always be coupled with thanksgiving. There has to be praise in your prayer life. It can't always just be, um, you know, wallowing <laughs> and begging. Like, there has to be this element of thanksgiving and, and, and a, continue, a continuous praise that comes with the prayer. Prayer is not always about groaning. It's part of a relationship, and, and it's a conversation. Conversations have dynamics, right? Sometimes they're, they're, they're one way, sometimes they're another. Conversations ebb and flow. It's the same with our prayer life. In fact, Philippians chapter 4, talking about our need to continue to pray, says this, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. There has to be an element of praise that comes into our prayer in order for it to be a truly effective conversation with the Lord. So we're told that. Look what it says here in verse 3 in our text. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison that I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak. 
Paul says, look, while you're on the prayers, while you're on that subject, while you're praying, pray for me. But I, I find it fascinating what Paul asks them to pray for. Paul doesn't say, hey, while you're praying, by the way, keep me in your prayers. Um, you know, my leg really hurts today. Hey, keep me in your prayers. You know, it's really not that fun being in prison. What is the thing Paul sends up his prayer request for? Hey, while you're praying, pray that God would open a door for us for the word to declare the gospel. That same gospel, by the way, which I'm in prison for. Pray for that. Paul is not asking for personal things. Paul is asking for more opportunity to share the gospel. And Paul uses that term a couple times, opening a door. Throughout the New Testament, we read the Pauline letters in the book of Acts, and it says, God opened a door for us to go to Thessalonica. God opened a door for us to do this. Like, this is the way that Paul thought about things. Hey, I'm just going to get any opportunity that God gives me to go and do ministry. So, hey, while you're praying steadfastly, while you're praying continuously, would you pray that God would give me more chances to share the gospel? Now think about where Paul is as he's writing this. He's in prison. And Paul says, I want more opportunity. I want, I want more opportunity to share Christ. Would you pray for that for me? What we pray about often reveals our heart. You know, it's one of those things that people say, you know, whatever you give your money towards shows what you really value. Whatever you give your time towards shows what you really value. Whatever you send up prayers for, whatever you're praying about shows what you value. And Paul valued the opportunity to be used by the Lord even in his chains. But this is the part that blows my mind. Look what it says in verse 4. That I may make it clear, which is how I ought to speak. Paul wanted them to pray that he would make the gospel clear and evident. Think about that. Paul, maybe the greatest evangelist of all time was still concerned that people understood the message of the gospel, was still asking for prayer that he would give a good delivery of the gospel to those who heard it. And that tells us that no matter how good we may have gotten at sharing our faith, we can always get better, right? And it also shows that Paul was humble enough to realize that he wasn't, you know, the best. He wanted to continue to improve in his ministry. And I think this is probably a good prayer for us, that we would pray that God would open doors for us and that he would help us to make the gospel clear. You know, every time we go into a situation uh, where we are sharing the truth of Jesus with someone, we would hope and we would pray that God would help us to make the gospel clear. I had a fun incident with that uh, this last week where I was at a first priority club and we had a student come in the room and he was kind of, a little weird, like it happens. And, and I'm sitting there wondering, like, I wonder if I'm going to get a chance to talk to this kid. And so I, I just said a quick prayer, like, Lord, let me, let me talk to this kid. And the kid walks right over to me. I'm wearing a, a Florida Panthers t-shirt, and he goes, I love hockey. I'm like, well, that worked. <laughs> right? So we start talking, and we get into this conversation, and it's amazing. And, and I find out that he, he has a different faith background, and we make this deal. I'll go to your church if you go to mine. And it became this thing where I, I don't know how that's going to play out, but I was just praying in that moment that I would have an opportunity to speak to him. I don't know that we always see the world that way, like when we're out and about at Walmart or whatever. Like, I don't know that we always look and say, God, would you give me an opportunity to share the gospel with someone today? I'm telling you this. If you prayed every morning that God opened a door for you to share the gospel with someone, he is going to show up. So you better be ready because it's not going to just be one person. It's going to be like all the people, right? Like he's going to give you opportunities to do that. Paul said, I want opportunities and I want to do it well. That's a great prayer for us to pray. And then he says this in verse five, look what it says. Walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. So I want you to catch that there is a transition here in what Paul is saying. He starts out with personal prayer time, 
communication with God, relationship with God on a personal level. And then he transitions here in, from the private relationship with the Lord to the public relationship with the Lord. So he says, you need to continue in prayer, be thankful as you do it, pray that we have opportunity to share the gospel, and also share the gospel. Like, that's the transition here. Like, you need to live on the outside in the same way that you live on the inside. Here's the thing, and I, I hate to tell you this, because maybe you didn't know this when you signed up to be a Christian. Like, maybe you didn't read all the terms and conditions. Like, I don't when I buy something on a website, and you just scroll to the end and click accept. But here's the truth. If you are a follower of Jesus, you are no longer entitled to a private life. Sorry. Should have read the terms and conditions. You are no longer entitled to privacy in your life. And I don't mean like, you know, privacy in your internet or your cameras at home or whatever. But what I'm saying is, you now have an obligation to live a public life that preaches the gospel. So you cannot be secret agent Christian man, double O cross or whatever. You can't be that. You have an obligation to now communicate the message of Jesus Christ to the people who you interact with. And so Paul says, hey, in light of that, here's what you need to know. If you're going to be a follower of Jesus, you need to walk in wisdom when you're around people who are not followers of Jesus. We need to ask ourselves, are we being good ambassadors for the Lord? And I know it's cliche, but it's true. You might be the only Christian that someone knows. And you have an obligation to represent Christ in that way. We all make assumptions about other people. You know, we, we make assumptions. We, we make stereotypes. We create those types of things. Like, we have this stereotype that, like, Southerners have funny accents. Sometimes it's true. <laughs> we have this stereotype that people from up north are rude. Sorry. I know y'all just came back. <laughs> we have this uh, stereotype that, like, everyone in California is a vegan like, we have these, these stereotypes that we assign to people. And I'm just going to tell you right now that the person in your life who doesn't know Jesus has a stereotype that they've pegged you with. They think that you hate other people uh, because somehow that's what the culture says Christians hate people. They think that you are probably stuck up. They think that you think that you're right all the time. Like, they have all these assumptions about who you are. Don't be afraid to break the stereotype and say, that's not what this looks like at all. I'm going to show you, I'm going to demonstrate to you what it looks like to be a follower of Jesus by living it out in front of you, not in a weird way like, hey, look at this, see what I just did? But in a way that says, this is who I am. And I'm going to walk in wisdom when I'm around people who are not believers to make sure that I'm representing Christ, but you know, not to add to the word of God, but I'll take it one step forward. You should just always walk in wisdom, whether they're not believers or not, or they are believers. Like we should always do our best to represent Jesus in the way that we live. And people are watching. People are watching. They are. I, uh, a couple weeks ago, I was in a store, and I was wearing a baseball cap, which apparently hides me somehow, which is crazy to think, because it's hard to miss me, but I'm wearing a baseball cap. And I saw a pastor that I know serves at a church in our community make some really poor decisions. I watched him do it, and he didn't see me. And he walked out, but I thought, you know, it's, it's sad that you know, I saw that, and I, and, I, and I made a judgment. I mean, I did, just to be honest, like I'm judging him in my mind, but you know, trying to pray through that, but I'm, like, I'm thinking about it. But at the same time, like what if it wasn't me who saw that? What if it was someone in his church or someone who had visited his church once? And so on and so forth. You know what I'm saying? So I'm not going to get into the details of what happened, but I'm just trying to tell you, like, people are watching how you respond to things. People are watching how you react and how you 
live your life. So we need to walk in wisdom, but I love that second part, making the best use of the time. Some translations say redeeming the time. I love that because it's like we're going to make the best use of our time that we have been given. And let me just ask you this question, like what do you spend your time on? What consumes your attention? These things, just like what we spend our money on or what we pray about, what we spend our time on is an indicator of what's ultimately important to us. So Paul says, you, use the time that you've been given. I don't know if you guys have read the latest statistics, but 10 out of 10 people die. That took a second for some of you. Everyone's going to die. Like, not to get morbid, but like your life has an expiration date. There is a finite, limited amount of time. Some of us are closer to it than others. But there is a limited amount of time that you have to live in this world. What are you going to leverage that time to do? Are we going to use that time to build wealth and have pleasure and, and do what we want to do? Or are we going to use that time to make Jesus known among the nations. I love Mark Cahill's book, The One Thing You Can't Do in Heaven. What's the one thing you can't do in heaven? Share the gospel. So while we're here on this earth, we should be using our lives for that purpose. So use, make the best use of the time. And then he gets into the, what that looks like personality-wise. Verse 6, let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. So basically what Paul is saying is make sure that when you're communicating with people that you're being gentle, that you're being kind, that you're being gracious in the way that you communicate it, but you're also seasoned with salt. Now this is why that's kind of a, an ancient thought uh, as to what they would use salt for. Of course, salt was often in ancient times a preservative. So rather than putting meat in a refrigerator, which they hadn't invented yet, they would cover meat with salt in order to preserve it, right? So, so salt was a, was a preserver. But salt was also kind of an a, 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 a irritant in a way. Like you would take salt and you would rub it into a, a wound supposedly to be healed, but it would also hurt. Right? So there's these different elements of how salt was used in ancient culture. In fact, oftentimes, uh, instead of carrying a money bag, people would carry a salt bag. And they would use salt to even make purchases. Like salt was a valuable thing, but they, they, it was valuable because it was useful. And so when Paul says we need to season our speech with salt, what he's trying to tell us is we need to make sure that our speech has an effect has a transformative effect, whether it's preserving or irritating or whatever. We need to make sure that it is, uh, has an effect, but we need to make sure that we use it in such a way that we can help people understand the gospel. Now, we are told that we should make sure that when we're communicating with people, we're communicating with people in order to build them up and encourage them rather than tear them down and criticize them. We have a problem, I think, in our culture today when it comes to people who follow Jesus. And that problem is very simply this. America knows everything that Christians are against, but very little about what Christians stand for. They are very knowledgeable about what we don't like. But when it comes to the things that we are trying to explain, like, hey, if you come to Jesus, there is hope in the name of Jesus. Like, it will transform the brokenness of your life if you put your faith in Jesus. Like, we want to see radical transformation for you that you can break free of addictions and chains and fear and anxiety and depression, that Jesus is the answer to every question in your life. Like, we have so much to offer, but yet so often we wield our speech to talk about what we are against rather than what we are for. And we have to make sure that that's not what we do. Paul would say this in Ephesians chapter 4. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths. It's up there somewhere. But only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. Paul says, make sure that nothing corrupting comes out of your mouth, but only which is good for building up. We have this imperative command to make sure that when people interact with us, we are speaking life 
into them rather than judgment. We are speaking the grace of Jesus, but also the truth of Jesus. And the reality of this is that truth is sometimes not going to be taken well. Truth is sometimes going to be rejected. And it's going to irritate in a way that you don't intend it to. But we speak the truth in love and we speak the truth graciously so that those who need to hear it, hear it and respond to it. And we're able to have a witness. We're able to speak. When I was in college years ago now, we, uh, we did this really cool thing where we got to do mall evangelism. And so we set up a table in the mall. And uh, the rules were very clear. You could sit behind the table, and if people walked by, you could talk to them from the table. And if they came over to the table, you could give them a track or you can share with them, like, more detail. And we did this for a couple of years. But as, and we did it every weekend. It was really cool, like, so many cool stories inside of that. But towards the end of my time in college, there was a guy who decided that he was above the rules. And so he took the tracks and he started walking around the mall handing them out. And so you know what happened? Security showed up. They kicked him out of the mall and then they closed down the whole operation. We weren't allowed to do it anymore. And as we went back to the college, he kept celebrating how he had been persecuted for the Lord. And I told him right to his face, you weren't persecuted, you're just an idiot. He didn't like that too much. But I was right. I mean, he was just being stupid. And then when things didn't go his way, he claimed that he was being persecuted. And, you know, I think sometimes we've got to be careful that the way we're, rep- that we're not just being jerks to people or we're not being judgmental towards people. And then when they don't respond to the gospel, we say, well, that's their deal. No, it's your deal. Like, you have a responsibility to correctly communicate and portray who Jesus is to the people around you. Now, ultimately, it's the Lord that saves them and not you. But you better be sure that you give your best effort to portray correctly the grace and mercy that can be found in Jesus Christ. So we want to make sure that we come across in that way that's building people up, not tearing people down, giving life, not causing frustration. And then Paul begins to wrap up this letter, verse 7. Tychicus will tell you all about my activities. He is a beloved brother and faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. And with him, Osimus, our faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you, they will tell you of everything that has taken place here. And Artichus, my fellow prisoner, greets you. And Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, Concerning whom you have received instructions, if he comes to you, welcome him. And Jesus, who is called Justice, these are the only men of the circumcision among my fellow workers for the kingdom of God, and they have been a comfort to me. Ephraim, who is one of you, a servant of Christ Jesus, greets you, always struggling on your behalf in his prayers, that you may stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God. For I bear him witness that he has worked hard for you and for those in Laodicea and Heropolis. Hey, I want to stop there for a second because I find this fascinating how Paul talks about his uh, friend or this guy who was from this area, Ephraim. Uh, I'm not sure if that's how you say it, but none of you guys are either. This is the thing. I think the way he talks about this is so fascinating because he actually says, this guy has been laboring for you in his prayers. This guy has been praying, continuing steadfastly in prayer for you. He's been struggling on your behalf that you would be mature in Christ. Paul gave credit to this guy that his prayers were being effectual in the spiritual development of the people there in Colossae. I mean, think about that. He's getting credit. He's being given uh, props by Paul for this because he mattered. His prayers mattered. He labored for them. 
And, and Paul says, I just got to give him a shout out. He has been praying so hard for you. And, and, and that's credited to this guy. I mean, it's written down in scripture for us to read 2,000 years later. That he labored in prayer for those people. And I think about, you know, as we were talking earlier in announcements, like we're, we're doing this thing where we're going to pray for unsaved people. And I don't think that we have a responsibility, like if we don't pray for people, they're not going to come to the Christ. But I can tell you this, it, it can't hurt, right? Like it's going to help. Like the Lord hears our prayers. And so like as we sign up and we, we put people's names down or we come to the prayer meeting when we're going to do it, you should come. Like we're going to labor for those people that they would know the gospel. And, and God is going to see that and respond to it, which is, again, crazy. I don't understand why he does it, but he hears what we say and it matters to him. It's a conversation that we have with the Lord. Lord, please encourage this person. Lord, please be with this person. Lord, please reveal yourself to this person and God will work in powerful ways. That prayer really does matter. Our prayers for others are effective. And that's what Paul is saying. They're effective. They worked. They helped. They, and, and sometimes I think maybe we get this feeling like, like that's maybe not true. It's interesting. In like 13 or 14 years of being a pastor on the staff here, how many times people have come up to me and said, well, I want you to pray with for me because God listens to you. First of all, how do you know? <laughs> right? How do you know? Like, wh why, why do we have this idea that God would listen to someone else rather than listen to me? It comes from a lack of relationship. You know what it's like? It's like when you're a kid and you want to have a sleepover at your friend's house. So instead of your friend asking his mom, what do you do? You, ha you go ask the mom, because she'll say no to her kid, but she'll probably say yes to you. Sometimes we, are, we act that way with the Lord. Well, I'm going to go ask Pastor Larry to pray for me. I'm going to come up after service. I'm going to ask Pastor Don to pray for this. Now, that's, there's nothing wrong with that. The Bible says very clearly, like, if any of you needs prayer, like, go to an elder and be prayed for. There's nothing wrong with that. But I'm saying sometimes we lack confidence to approach Jesus. But the Bible says very clearly that because of the shed blood of Jesus, you and I can boldly approach the throne of grace. So there shouldn't be this whole, like, if I pray to this guy, or if, I pray, if this guy prays for me, it's going to change things. Or, you know, even in some traditions, it's like, I'm going to pray to a saint because God listens to stuff. No, God hears your prayers. He does. And your prayers are powerful and effective. So don't lose confidence in them, but continue steadfastly in them, and you will see results. And Paul finishes out his letter here in verse 14. Luke the beloved physician greets you, as does Demas. Give my greetings to the brothers at Laodicea and at Nympha and the church in her house. And when this letter has been read among you, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans. And see that you also read the letter from Laodicea. And say to Archippus, Archippus see that you fulfill the ministry that you have received in the Lord. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. As Paul signs off from this letter, he encourages them really in two things. One, the second thing really is he, re he encourages them to remember him and remember what's going on and to pray for him. Because Paul really did live it out. What he's preached, he did. But he also encourages this guy to fulfill the ministry that he's received from the Lord. And I just want to leave off our time together today by challenging you with this. There is a ministry that the Lord has called you to. You know, I talked about it a minute ago, that when it comes to living the life of a Christian, there's no private lives anymore. There's no secret agent Christians. That means that God has something that you're supposed to do. And it's not always this simple or this super spiritual thing like I have to sell everything I have and move to the mission field. Sometimes it's, hey, I want you to interact with that person you see at Starbucks every week but never say hi to. Sometimes it's, I want you to, to, to lift up others in prayer and just encourage them with gracious speech. 
Maybe, maybe it's, hey, I'm calling you to, to, to serve in the children's ministry. I'm calling you to, to go and give like you've done well financially and you're going to give so that the gospel can go out. Like, I don't know what it is that God's calling you to, but you have a ministry that you have received from the Lord. And if you don't know what it is yet, I have a really great suggestion. Pray and ask the Lord what that ministry is and then fulfill it. I mean, gosh, it seems so simple. Like, I feel like I should have more notes about this, but it's just a simple thing. Fulfill the ministry that God has called you to. Look around, see where you can be impactful, see where you can live out your faith, and then do that thing. As simple as it is, sometimes that can be the hardest thing to do because it requires us to put ourselves out there. It requires us to be vulnerable. It requires us to lean in to the Lord and rely on him because ultimately we can't fulfill the ministry he's called us to unless he's with us. Paul got that. Paul understood that. Guys, we have to be looking for opportunity to live the life that Christ has called us to. Not a life that is self-focused, but a life that's focused on him. And ultimately our prayer life becomes a conversation the best, the best prayer life is a prayer life that just never stops. Not that you're always on your knees in a closet begging the Lord, but just a prayer life that is a conversation between two people who have an intimate relationship, you and the Lord. And when you live in that kind of prayer life, it's not this formalized thing. It's not drudgery. It's just saying, hey, I'm gonna live every day in relationship with Jesus and looking to fulfill the mission that he's called me to. And that's what we should do as followers of Jesus. Live a life pleasing to the Lord and fulfill the ministry that he's called us to. Amen? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we love you. We want to have intimate relationship with you that's conversational, not transactional. Lord, we want to have a conversation with you. We want to be with you. We want to do what you've called us to do. And Lord, we know that we're never going to know what you have for us to do unless we talk to you about it. We're never going to be aware of what you're doing unless we're in relationship with you. So Lord, help us to do that. Help us to live a life that fulfills the ministry you've called us to, that walks in relationship with you and is effective at the same time. Lord, we love you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. If you would like to be prayed for, or maybe there's someone that God's put on your heart to pray for that they would come to salvation, we just want to invite you to come to one of the two tables on the side here. Pastors and elders will be there to pray with you and for you. Uh, and we just want to see uh, that happen today as we sing. For the rest of us, let's stand up together and worship.